morning, sir. Good morning, good morning, Tripti. Hello, no. Yeah. So we have with us Surgeon Captain Dr. Shambhu Datta here. Mm. Hello, Shambhu. Good morning. Uh, morning, sir. Sir, morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put your uh, morning, sir. Uh, video on. Video on. Please put your video yeah, yeah, on. Yes, sir. Sir, can you see me, yeah. sir? Yeah, 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 I can. We can see you. Thank you. And uh, is Naveen there? Naveen also there? Has Naveen logged in? Afraid not, sir. Not yet. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can. Uh, Shambhu, uh, have you been uh, uh, to any of these sessions earlier? Uh, yes, sir. In uh, API, I have given in Vijag. Uh, no, 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 no. This this particular session, like we have been conducting this for many. Uh, no, weeks sir, now. no, sir, no, sir, no, sir. This uh, I have purely presented in Physician Forum of uh, API. No, no. Um, what I am saying is, have you ever participated in uh, uh, these programs that we have been conducting for the last 73, 73 weeks? Uh, in between, we had every daily also. Uh, sir, sir, yes, sir. You know, you haven't been. No, I, I was. Oh, no, I just uh, wanted to know whether you know the scheme of uh, this particular program, how it goes. Uh, yes, sir. No, I, I know uh, Professor Kripti, madam, of course, uh, and a couple of other uh, in, uh, in ISCCM and uh, yeah. Asian Forum. Yeah. No, no, the, uh, this particular program we've been conducting uh, for the last almost one year. Yes, sir. Uh, about 10 months. And uh, I, know, I thought that you uh, had an op opportunity to this uh, to listen to us. Perhaps you would be knowing uh, how to go about it. Uh, you know that you have to share your content once you uh, you yes, have sir. made your yeah. yeah. I I I load it, sir. Once uh, yeah. you tell, go ahead. Uh, then, sir, should I load the, the presentation, sir? No, no. You have already there on your desktop. No, it is there, sir. Yeah, then uh, the moment it's there in the desktop, we have to open that and go to the share the, share the content yes, and yes. automatically it will come. Okay? Yes, sir. The moment you yeah. tell, I'll do it, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. And uh, Tripti will be doing that job. Okay? Yes, yes, yes. Sir. Yeah, yes, sir. she will be introducing you. Yeah. Yes. Okay, then. Thank you. So, we have been doing, uh, Dr. Datta, we have been doing uh, webinars from a long time, uh, very grateful to our principal, Dr. Sudhakar sir, for uh, starting this tradition here. Uh, every week we've been having updates on COVID-19 and uh, we had a marathon uh, sessions uh, for about 31 days uh, precisely, uh, which ended recently on the Thursday. And from now onwards, again, every Sunday, we've been planning to have these sessions, morning hours. Yes. That is good. Usually it is in Sunday morning, ma'am. Yes. Yes, it's on Sunday morning. Okay. So actually, ma'am, simultaneously, a lot of activities are going on. ISCCM, Vijak, they are having one critical care forum. And then in between API and uh, this national, uh, so that also I am participating a little bit. Uh, this API, both uh, uh, our AP and Orissa Association, as well as... Uh, one link from Delhi also I have been doing. So there are a lot of uh, activities in COVID and especially time is also there is uh, this thing because morning to evening and evening to night also we are working. I'm alone actually in this hospital for COVID. Other people are not coming because uh, that is a problem. Right, sir. So in between whatever from what and all we try to keep in touch, but this also I'll be in touch with you and uh, will be benefited. Thank you, sir. We've been hear hearing a lot that you've been doing uh, with uh, so many 
uh, strategies regarding the Bain circuit and all. I'm sure you'll be talking about it in the uh, yes, talk. I today. also learned it and knew this thing because of some newspaper and then I have personally talked also so to few of the Gujarat uh, critical care and uh, Madhya Pradesh, uh, some physician who are doing it. After getting convinced only, I used it and then I used extensively. Uh, of oh, course, uh, material shortage was a logistic was a big problem. I did not get so even we had to sterilize and reuse some of the other yeah. things. So that was the issue. Wonderful, sir. I believe we have Dr. A.P. Navin Kumar, sir, with ah. us. Good morning, good morning, good. Uh, good morning, sir. Morning, sir. Morning, good morning, sir. Uh, Navin. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And you can uh, put your uh, video also on so that uh, we can see you. Uh, yes, sir. it's on, sir. Yeah. yeah, right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we will start by sharp 630. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Hi, Navin. Ah, hello. <laughs> hello, Malish. Navin, sir, morning. Uh, good Navin, morning, morning. Shambhu. <laughs> I think last we met in this, this online CME on diabetes. Uh, yeah, that's what. <laughs> Actually, it's sir, only on onla online meetings which we are having nowadays. Actually, this particular uh, forum is also, I am, uh, <clears throat> this is the first one because uh, I have been otherwise busy with this ISCCM activities, uh, COVID and uh, some of the API activities. Yeah, yeah, I know that. <laughs> hmm. So, how is it in St. Anne's? It's come down? Sir, come down, sir. At one time, I had 74 full <laughs> bedded. That was a government uh, sanctioned uh, 74. It was a government COVID hospital. Yeah, yeah. We I had at that. one time 74. Now reduced to four, in fact, sir. Yeah, good. <laughs> so now it is almost an on COVID again. But OPDs are still there, sir. Mild and yeah. mild. Yeah, still there are a lot of mild and moderate. Mild cases yeah. there, sir. We are, we are down to 22 from 126. <laughs> that is great, sir. How, how, what's the capacity of the ICU beds at St. Anne, sir? We have, we, we have, madam, six, six bed ICU. Out of that one ICU, we have dedicated. And we made a new uh, makeshift ICU because uh, we had also non-COVID ward. So our ICU, that uh, old ICUs are in that non-COVID section. So the COVID ward, which is top floor, so we had to shift some of the equipment and make a makeshift uh, ICU. And our problem was uh, out of our two invasive ventilator, one has been taken by government. So they have not written and uh, yeah. uh, have given us two HFNO actually and uh, and few BIPAP in exchange. So that is okay, but it is good for me alone. Managing uh, invasive is difficult. Right. I believe you are the only physician working at Sentence. So you must be happy. Yeah. Uh, physicians are there, but mostly they are private ones or uh, con consultants. So during COVID time, uh, the problem is uh, availability was a problem. So they denied of uh, this thing. They were seeing non-COVID. So I was in pure COVID. So in fact, uh, now onward, now also I'm seeing mostly COVID only, OPD and this thing. So gradually, I think another seven days will revert back to normal. Oh, that's good news, sir. Seven yeah. days reverting back. I think I forgot most of the uh, this thing, uh, <laughs> diabetes, heart failure, and which I am generally interested and uh, tropical infections, other things, so it's uh, purely COVID. Other diseases vanished once we have started having COVID with us. Yes, ma'am. Somehow yeah. disappeared hardly. Now, but dengue is again coming back. A lot of dengue patients. Yeah, yeah. But there's a cross-react with it. We have to be careful. Yeah, that is also there, sir. When uh, you are uh, CT and uh, RT-PCR positive and we are showing yeah. uh, this dengue. And even, sir, typhoid, especially typhoid yeah. positive is very, very patient. Yeah, yeah. They keep fighting uh, with us in the OPD that it is typhoid. Yeah. Don't call it COVID. The moment you tell COVID, they get very agitated. Irritated. <laughs> no, but I think uh, what we have, uh, the COVID has done us uh, is we have gone into a tubular vision, especially we physicians. We need to come out of it. It's really difficult. As rightly said, uh, we, we are forgetting all our uh, bread and butter uh, drugs and all that earlier. <laughs> And of course, sir, some of the uh, little disappointing things that we have been last one and a half years, we are using uh, drugs like ivermectin, azithro and doxy with good success rate. And however, suddenly uh, that WHO dropping ivermectin, 
Yeah, of all people, DCCI dropping uh, uh, that is was not yeah. very, very unfortunate. Yes, I heard that uh, Professor Sasang Joshi is and uh, they have uh, promised that they will fight with uh, WHO yeah, and DCCI. Yeah, yeah, they're good. Mm. And it seems they're uh, going on it. Professor Paul, no, Maric no. Also, Paul Maric also was of the opinion that yeah. it will be. Yes. No, no. Shambhu, you yes, have sir. to fight, you have to have evidence. Evidence is, sir, evidence yeah, is there, no, no, sir. Uh, uh, evidence is, is there, uh, not uh, by even, uh, and authorities are quite good, sir. Ms. Professor Sasang Joshi, if you see the Japi editorial article, sir, he has published, and uh, including in vitro and in vivo, both studies were there, sir. No, no, but no, only so thing, the, sir, probably we, we, could not we, we, present we, in a we, good forum. Yeah. No, no, that's what, no, that's what makes all the difference. Uh, it should be evidence-based. Number two, it should be peer-reviewed. So only when it, it is peer reviewed, uh, then only it will have some value. So that's how we can fight. But you know, you cannot fight without um, evidence. We cannot fight with anecdotal experience. We cannot fight with the personal experiences. Okay. Uh, with that note, uh, we let us start the meeting. Okay. Right, sir. Okay, sir. Yeah, okay, now sir. that we have more than hundred people on board, um, uh, friends, uh, good morning. Very good morning for to all those who are in India, and a very good evening to all those in the United States. And I'm very glad that we are continuing with our uh, regular webinars related to COVID to enrich our knowledge um, with the COVID by a group of experts that we have. And um, till recently, we had almost um, daily webinars on a daily basis for over 31 uh, days. And again, we are back to the weekly webinars. And uh, this time, instead of having it in the night, we are having it during early in the morning when we felt it is more appropriate and it's more convenient for people who are in the United States also who have been contributing, contributing enormously for, the, for our knowledge. So I am very glad that Dr. Tripti Erramili will be moderating this session, who is an assistant professor of anesthesiology in Andhra Medical College. And she's, in, she's leading, the, uh, leading from the front in treating these patients. She has treated hundreds of the patients, very hardworking, and um, she is uh, truly professional. I thought she would be appropriate to handle this particular webinar today, wherein uh, we have two distinguished speakers. Uh, without wasting much time, over to Dr. Tripti to introduce Surgeon Captain Dr. Shambhu Datta and um, uh, proceed further to introduce Dr. Naveen after Dr. Shambhu Datta completes his presentation. And she'll be taking the questions after each of these uh, presentations. And later, uh, maybe after Dr. Naveen completes, she'll have one more round of uh, uh, questions uh, posed to both the speakers. With that note, I hand over the proceedings to Dr. Tripti Armilli. Dr. Tripti, over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the introduction. Good morning, one and all here in India, and a very good evening to all in the US. Welcome to the 73rd continuous medical update on COVID-19. Uh, it's incredible that our audience has been increasing in numbers. Um, I suppose we have uh, an ongoing IDCCM, um, national IDCCM uh, meeting also today. But then uh, 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 taking it further, today we have with us two very distinguished speakers, Surgeon Captain Dr. Shambhu Datta and Dr. A.P. Naveen with us. The first talk would be delivered by uh, Surgeon Captain Dr. Datta, followed by Dr. Naveen. And uh, uh, introducing Captain Surgeon Dr. Datta, he's passed his MBBS from Katak and he did his DNB from New Delhi. Uh, he has a fellowship in intensive care medicine. He's headed the medicine department in Indian Navy Command Hospital, INS Kalyani Vaisang. He has many research publications to his credit, a recipient of many awards by the armed forces. At present, he is the head of the department and chief consultant, internal medicine and intensive care unit at St. Anne's Hospital, Sriharipuram, Vishakapatnam. Today, he would be addressing the burning issue of the pandemic that COVID-19 has brought to us. 
which is oxygenation in severe and critically ill COVID patients. Over to you, uh, Dr. Datta. Very good. Uh, good morning to all. And uh, my special thank to uh, Professor and Dean Sir Sudhakar Sir and Dr. A.P. Navin Kumar Sir and uh, Professor Tripti Madam for uh, inviting and helping me to speak on this occasion. And uh, I'm really delighted and honored. And uh, now coming to our subject proper, we'll straightway go. So oxygen therapy in the treatment of severe and critical COVID in a resource poor setting like which, which we have is really a Herculean task. And we learned most of the things here only. It was neither textbook or not much of uh, data was there. And uh, uh, as uh, last one and a half years, you know that uh, as pandemic was going on, and uh, data were changing and uh, a lot of directives and guidelines were uh, uh, getting changed. So with that in background, uh, we'll be discussing what all uh, we can do in a resource poor setting in, with respect to oxygenation. So oxygen therapy, we know uh, this knowledge is very essential, not only for the uh, doctors who are at uh, specialist level, but also even primary, secondary or tertiary care also. And as the, our famous professor, Dr. Andeep Guleria, who is heading the COVID mission in the country, he also told that uh, the knowledge of oxygen therapy is most important rather than ventilators, because most of the patients will be managed by without ventilation with oxygen. And invasive ventilators in COVID management is also, we know, that associated with high mortality. So our basic aim is to learn oxygen therapy uh, with devices which are non-invasive today. And now we know that oxygen dissociation curve, you see the flat portion. If we, if we try to get this flat wave that is 92% above of saturation, actually we will not achieve anything other than wasting oxygen. Because now we have already faced scarcity of oxygen. We know in my hospital itself for one night, uh, I was almost uh, not having much oxygen and almost I had to request state government, armed forces, and many other authorities to uh, get the, the situation under control. And luckily within two, three hours, we got some oxygen and we managed. So that uh, it was almost 20 days back or uh, 25 days back. And almost many hospitals faced on the same night, similar situation. There was absolute scarcity of oxygen. So we have to uh, keep in mind that oxygen should not be wasted and unnecessarily, we should not try to get a saturation of 96, 97, that kind of figure. So that is very evident from the oxygen dissociation curve. Now, again, suppose the patient has got COPD where we can manage when 88% saturation is adequate, we know that. And conservation of oxygen is very essential and rational use is very important, especially in resource poor setting and home care. Why I mentioned home care? Because now home care uh, is a very important uh, concept in COVID management because many of our COVID patients are being discharged at home with oxygen, many of them. At least 30 to 40% discharges are with concentrator or cylinder at home. So the dependent, the next of kin of the patient also should know how to manage an oxygen cylinder, how to use it properly without wasting. And we also know that 100% oxygen has its own problem like atelectasis, like ocular injury and nerve injuries. And as doctors, our primary concern should be primum non nocere. That is a Greek word. Basically, we should not harm at the beginning. So just I put this picture to emphasize that many of us, many of us are sometimes forget how the oxygen cylinder uh, thing works and how the system works because suddenly many times I find even myself that I along with only one staff sometime and managing oxygen cylinder and it becomes really, really difficult with different companies with different manufacturers we should know that is where the basic of oxygen how to remove the valve and how to uh, use the humidifier how much to fill up those things are very very essential and especially this more important we must train the relatives the next of kin while discharging patient on oxygen that how best he can use the oxygen cylinder and we know that oxygen uh, has got also uh, it is a fire hazard so it's a explosive so all these things have to be trained to the patient while on discharge and also in hospital almost all the staff they should know from ambulance driver to the uh, ward amma to the uh, non-medical staff everybody should know at least to open an oxygen cylinder in this pandemic it, uh, it has taught us, it is just like a fire extinguisher. Everybody should know CPR, fire extinguisher, oxygen use. It is a must, inescapable. So now coming to our objective, we'll see hypoxia and COVID-19 and also goals of oxygen in severe and critical COVID and different oxygen delivery systems, whether it is conventional oxygen therapy or high flow nasal oxygen 
or non invasive ventilation including vent circuit that is a slightly a topic which is close to my heart now i am a bit working on that and i am interested and i uh, i will be discussing little bit and on that and also little bit of avac proning which everybody knows we will not discuss much avac proning is very important and oxygen conservation methods now introduction oxygen is essential for all metabolic process and vital organ functions we know that and lack of oxygen causes irreversible damage to the tissue and in covid 19 typical it will be a type 1 respiratory failure for that 14% to 15% patients will require oxygen in hospital and out of that 5% patients will be critical and they will require icu admission okay and those who are having severe hypoxemia they will require non invasive respiratory support and it has also been seen generally in covid pneumonia while managing hypercapnia is not a problem much a problem and another very interesting issue which subjective dyspnea is absent that is called happy hypoxia i have got many patients i have got photographs unfortunately we can't share because of lack of time many patients walking into opd with a saturation of 65 70 what they were walking into and they are going for their basic x ray and all when i saw the saturation is only 74 and uh, even mortality was high even in happy hypoxia <clears throat> this is the typical um, uh, curve in hypoxia how it sets in okay this is from bmj actually and you see the first week the symptom onset and then towards the end of the first week that intra pulmonary shunting happens because of edema and atrial ectasis then because of the pathology intravascular microthrombi the loss of lung perfusion regulation starts and towards the end of reduced lung compliance increased dead space increased consolidation co2 retention and because of patient severe anxiety fatigue the dyspnea increases the saturation decreases and we know that in the antiviral when to use when to use anti inflammatory and when to use lung protective ventilation prone ventilation ecmo all these things are there this is basically a flow chart from bmj now clinically in a bedside especially in a government hospital or in a resource poor setting we have to uh, actually depend more on clinically and uh, as a doctor or healthcare worker with proper pp we should not fear for clinical examination i do clinical examine every patient like whether covid or non covid in the same manner i don't differentiate between uh, while examining whether it is a covid patient or a malaria patient when i am in full pp so one thing is dyspnea tachypnea and chest tightness most common symptom and nowadays many patients will come with just one symptom they will tell severe weakness that is a very very good clinical marker and uh, we must suspect then peripheral oxygen saturation spo2 monitor i call spo2 monitor a magic instrument because not only because of covid during hemodynamic uh, management also this spo2 monitor with advanced spo2 monitor pulse pressure variation pulse uh, this uh, uh, index they were also very very useful so i have been a fan of spo2 monitor last seven or uh, last more than 10 years and because the ease the speed and the availability of data with just a finger uh, pulse oximeter is enormous and entire covid management if you see entire the world it is on spo2 monitor mostly 90% uh, therapy or uh, treatment is depends on spo2 monitor and also atrial oxygen partial pressure we measure then p by f ratio that is po2 by fio2 ratio then sf ratio is very very simple that is basically saturation by fio2 so we know that if sf ratio is less than 200 or less than 300 there that is basically ards Uh, protocol and we have to start non invasive ventilation because we have to reduce the work of breathing so if work of breathing will reduce uh, then uh, how we will know that work of breathing is uh, worsening basically it is a clinical diagnosis if you see the accessory uh, accessory muscles of respiration are being used alanazai or intercostal in drawing tracheal tug all these things we have to see clinically if these are there in the patient then we must suspect patient's uh, work of breathing has increased and we have to go for a non invasive ventilation so now what is the goal of oxygen the oxygen goal is basically to increase the alveolar oxygen which in turn will increase the blood oxygen and then correction of acute hypoxemia hypoxemia with decrease of hypoxic symptoms like dyspnea will reduce tachypnea will reduce patient's mental function will be better he will be more alert these are all clinical signs and that will also decrease the cardiopulmonary workload decrease the workload of the heart and decrease the pulmonary vasoconstrictions we know that hypoxia is the most powerful vasoconstrictor so as we correct the uh, hypoxia the pulmonary vasoconstriction also gets corrected and in ward we should have a target of uh, saturation to 92 to 94% at 
and in icu we can make 90 to 92 90 to 92 this is the aims uh, delhi protocol because why there is a justification in icu we have got more scope of intervention okay and we can still conserve oxygen and icu patients are usually uh, more serious even getting 90 to 92 is herculean task and if we can achieve 92 also in icu we should be happy and we should not increase the saturation more than 94 percent it is basically it causes more disadvantage more of oxygen toxicity and wasteful we have to conserve oxygen at this scenario we had already faced the uh, oxygen uh, shortage phase so we know how we manage so we have to conserve oxygen so what are the oxygen delivery devices these are the devices to deliver oxygen to conscious patient with no instrumentation or no interference the airway one is conventional oxygen that is variable perfusion system with low flow or fixed perfusion system with high flow and there is thing called hfno or high flow nasal oxygen and non invasive ventilation will come one by one this conventional oxygen is delivered it delivers the fio2 remains fixed or varies as per the patient requirement there can be high flow where the system provides the patients the system takes over it provides the patient the entire uh, inspiratory uh, flow and fio2 is stable and there is something called low flow system where the patient draws the remainder of oxygen from the surrounding air okay here minute volume is more and fio2 is low so we you know what is minute volume minute volume is basically respiratory rate into tidal volume this is the key element on which the uh, depends the fi2 value of the patient if suppose patient has got respiratory distress versus a patient who has got not re non respiratory distress here the minute volume decides how much fi2 the patient uh, uh, will be uh, requiring now coming to nasal cannula this is the most commonly used and most simple anybody can put it okay but it can only give fi2 of 0.24 to 0.44 percent with 1 to 6 liter oxygen like if you give one liter then it will give 0.24 percent if you that is 24 if you give two liter if you increase by one liter there will be addition of 10 10 10 so finally you can maximum achieve with six liter of oxygen a 0.44 or 44 fi2 <clears throat> what is the advantage anybody can use i told very tolerable at home also when you are discharging patient patients relatives or next of kin can use it patient can drink eat cough and talk there is no problem the disadvantage are very mild dry crusted nostril wastage little bit of oxygen wastage will be there and there won't be any peep when there will be requirement of peep to increase the spo2 oxygenation we can't do this with simple nasal cannula now coming to the most popular hudson mask we used it uh, left and right in most of our wards okay here maximum fi2 we can achieve 0.6 it is a semi rigid plastic mask very cheap easy to fit but unfortunately at some time when the epidemic was in peak here uh, some few days back even this hudson mask in market was very difficult to get okay i had to really uh, wait for one to two hours to uh, get a mask because uh, we had run short of and uh, even patients next of kin relatives were also not able to get it from the surgical stores there was a huge short supply in presence of respiratory distress rebreathing of <coughs> CO2 happens when you are putting a Hudson mask when patient has got more uh, minute volume so he uh, respiratory rate increases so there is little bit of CO2 also accumulates okay uh, sorry CO2 uh, also gets reabsorbed so oxygen flow rate is usually 4 liter per minute we maintain and this is the another popular and very very uh, uh, useful in this COVID scenario and uh, this non NRBM or non rebreather mask okay we used it extensively okay so this we know that as the uh, this uh, picture shows it has got an exhalation valve and also uh, inhalation valve and it has got a reservoir bag okay so uh, basically reservoir bag uh, when it's full it gives the pip okay it gives the pressure okay support and patient's oxygenation usually increases with much less amount of oxygen so <clears throat> low flow device with high fio2 you can achieve reservoir bag capacity is one liter it has got a one-way valve between the mask and reservoir bag it can be set to deliver fio2 from 0.8 to even 9.95 very high even with just oxygen of 10 to 15 liter but most important is it should fit tight i have seen in the wards that one size they brought for all and many of the patients with different facial figure or different uh, anthropometric measurements 
so the mask was not fitting uh, half of the mask was below chin or it was going beyond uh, this thing nose so if it is not tight fit it uh, fails to serve the purpose the nrbm should fit absolutely tight and reservoir bags should be inflated always we should ensure that is the key message now another thing which we not used much in my hospital that is venturi mask okay it is very high flow concentration of oxygen okay there is a jet kind of thing is there which pushes oxygen and simultaneously it sucks the uh, atmospheric air also so oxygen from 40 to 50% at liter flow of 4 to 15 liter per minute the mask is so constructed that there is a constant flow of room air will blend with a fixed concentration of oxygen like this you can see there are different color in those colors it decide how much liter of oxygen if you use a blue one that gives 2 liter these are universal design okay and it is a green color which will give you 60% of oxygen okay so this is called venturi device now this is very popular it became very very popular hfno okay last couple of four, three to four years in most of the critical care and other uh, api physician conference or ccf conference we used to see that lot of companies were uh, trying to get hfno and uh, suddenly the requirement went up because of this covid hfno almost it was used extensively okay so uh, advantage is that it can on, almost give 70 liter uh, per minute uh, air oxygen flow and uh, this is the typical device this is a high performance circuit which is attached with a uh, heated humidifier and a mixer which will generate pressure and it will give uh, the oxygen deliver through wide bore binasal prong and <clears throat> when the patient now there are some of the controversies and some of the this thing that which is better bipap is better or hfno is better there are some uh, journals or some of the protocols they tell that when bipap is not useful then hfno but hfno requires very high amount of oxygen consumption and somehow i have seen that pip is not very effective so we have uh, in uh, working round as a grassroots level worker uh, i have my own reservation so that we'll discuss but hfno is very popular uh, and it is uh, but you require a very good source of oxygen and high flow oxygen for this now when hfno we are discussing we must know the rox index this is basically respiratory rate oxygenation index is defined as the ratio of oxygen saturation and fraction of inspired air to the respiratory rate this basically was first uh, this concept was uh, coined by roca et al in 2016 and uh, where basically they were studying lot of pneumonia cases and when they saw this rox index is less than 4.88 they measured that when the rox index was more than uh, less than 4.88 patient required intubation and sensitivity was good 70% specificity was 72.4 also the same was also used in the famous florali study they are also for successful weaning from hfnc they made a cutoff value of rox 9.2 so based on these studies rox index was identified as a very easy to use instrument bedside for covid 19 patient who presented with hypoxic arf so when to put them in uh, uh, non invasive ventilation so rox scoring was a deciding factor for that so now coming to niv with the niv is two type one is either cpap or bipap cpap is continuous positive pressure throughout the respiratory cycle it will give bipap has got two elements one is epap and ipap epap is basically like pip it basically keeps the alveoli partly inflated increase the lung volume okay and uh, also uh, increase the lung volume and uh, improves alveolar gas exchange and improve oxygenation similarly if you see ipap it supports the inspiratory effort basically ipap is like pressure support it augments the tidal volume and improves carbon dioxide removal along with that the main advantage of ipap it reduces the work of breathing which is very very important because that only causes respiratory fatigue and respiratory failure now coming to first step in the niv your face mask there are many types of face mask most commonly used in our scenario was full face mask advantage very few air leak and little cooperation patient is required disadvantage patient feels claustrophobic difficulty in a patient who is vomiting or eating or we have to give some sublingual or tablets orally very difficult it causes little bit of nasal breathe skin damage speech is difficult and coughing is also difficult with this 
now coming to nasal mask not much of use this nasal mask is actually mostly used for sleep apnea syndrome however to some extent uh, we also tried in covid scenario only thing uh, patient can able to speak eat or drink it allows cough also and it reduces the danger with vomiting but disadvantage when the mouth is open air gets leaked and it also causes nasal skin injury and it always requires patent nasal passage if somebody has got sinusitis or some kind of nasal obstruction dns then it is a problem and not much useful in covid scenario we have seen now this helmet mask became very popular in covid okay you can see the typical full helmet okay <clears throat> is advantage is minimum air leak so covid aerosol and infection to the healthcare worker was minimized and greater tolerance patient could tolerate more and there is no nasal or facial skin damage and uh, decreased risk of infection to healthcare worker as i discussed and disadvantage is rebreathing of the same air it was noisy it causes a lot of noise and it has got little bit of asynchrony with uh, pressure support uh, ventilation and also discomfort to axilla if you see the helmet mask the belts are tied up to the axilla okay so once they are tightly tied up it causes axillary pain inside axilla they get some pain and also little bit of skin erosion on the long term means we have seen so now coming when you are putting the patient on niv these are the parameter you must check uh, day to day many a times you have to check one is spo2 that is vital another is respiratory rate we try to keep respiratory rate minimum if respiratory is less than 25 then it is good respiratory above 30 is not a good thing tidal volume if possible we should check breathing pattern we must see whether there is uh, alanazai or extra uh, muscles are being used intra uh, coastal muscles are being used that means we are not able to yet uh, justify the oxygenation abg if possible if feasible we should do abg because uh, whether there is hypercarbia or inadequate hypo uh, hypoxemia and not corrected we can know from abg also we must watch for silly what is silly that is self induced lung injury because if you are uh, giving excessive tidal volume generating then there will be lung injuries that is called silly contraindications to niv agitated uncooperative patient we can't use we know that decreased uh, this i faced a uh, lot of uh, agitated uncooperative especially the elderly patient very elderly 85 90 because of happy hypoxia they used to remove they used to throw it out they used to stand erect on the bed once we are putting that niv so that was a real problem and when patient has got decreased sensorium gcs is low it is difficult and when patient cannot protect his airway because of low glasgow coma scale or uh, uh, obtunded uh, sensorium we can't use patient has got persistent vomiting very difficult hemodynamic instable patient then niv is a difficult thing those who have got uh, coronary artery disease or, or those who are got uh, Uh, poor ejection fraction, very poor, less than twenty, twenty-five percent. It is very difficult for them. Okay, can cause complication. And those who have got copious respiratory secretion for them also, NIV was difficult. Now coming to the topic which I uh, wanted to discuss was this Ben circuit. This is a very simple circuit. We know that it is basically used for anesthesia station. Now we have uh, got the modification. This is uh, Mapleson D type, which is mostly being used. Okay, you can see that pipe and uh, basically NIV mask has been modified. okay and the, at the distal side there is a valve okay and there is a uh, uh, reservoir bag so this famous article i want to quote because many there are many resistance when this uh, thing was used in some of the hospitals in rajasthan madhya pradesh and gujarat extensively because of uh, in the uh, critical uh, covid cases so he is uh, professor dr rajesh misra he is the president elect indian society of critical care medicine he gave a statement that ben circuit helps to utilize 100% of oxygen without any wastage whereas nrbm mask can only do 30 to 40% and lot of wastage so they have been using this to save people's life okay and he is professor rajesh misra he is the president elect indian society of critical care medicine a big man of critical care in uh, nation and gujarat and ben circuit the use of this ben circuit technique has become more prevalent widespread even in 1972 the physician called ben he rediscovered this uh, technique giving oxygen to the patients at high pressure and it is an old cure for the new disease of corona found okay so it is an alternative to bipap even i have seen patients who are not maintaining very well with bipap and your oxygen use is more and uh, you are wasting lot of oxygen so better to shift to ben circuit 
and many hospitals in maharashtra gujarat andhra pradesh and mp hyderabad the technique has been successfully used most of the hospital they have a data of 250 300 data but not yet very well uh, coalesced and uh, put up for uh, this thing aaj sudhakar sir told that we have to put up in a scientific forum in a scientific way then only it will be approved here in sentence hospital where i work as in charge covid also we used extensively brain uh, brain circuit more than 25 patients we have used and these patients were referred through to nrbm bipap and even hfnu and we got significant success without much so called carbon dioxide retention because i had also tested the carbon dioxide retention by uh, getting from my ot the etco and also i did frequent abgs and i have seen that there was not much of hypercarbia and we could achieve 95% saturation only with 5 to 10 liter of oxygen this have is the same we used to get by 30 to 40 liter oxygen in hfno in the index patients and i have submitted a paper for european society of critical care medicine for their annual conference which is forthcoming not yet accepted or uh, the status is not known i will definitely be happy to declare if it gets as place now ben circuit the device consists of replacing the single branch circuit of ben or modified maple sand d circuit with a double coaxial uh, uh, tube and bag of ben circuit and phase gas flows are eliminated basically we know that and ben circuit is connected to the nib device so and uh, we know that the expired air goes through the valve okay and the inspired air goes through the tube inside tube inside the corrugated tube another green color tube which carries the oxygen and here the advantage is oxygen uh, the which goes also becomes warm and moist because of the expired air and this is the only one article which i could found which came in a international reputed journal that is anesthesia journal of spain and this came in uh, january 2020 by tasman g et al you can search it and they have supported and in spain they have used ben circuit other than uh, india of course many hospitals in pakistan and bangladesh is pakistan uh, ben circuit was used extensively and this is the bmg article which basically uh, shows the chart that how to manage oxygen in covid patients so this is of course everybody knows that when patient has got hypotension hemodynamic instability then you have to go for invasive mechanical ventilation however we should know that invasive mechanical ventilation in covid patient particular mortality is very high so if those things are not there then probably you can go for either hfnc here high flow nasal oxygen is uh, uh, uses more supported i have difference of opinion i use niv more than hfnc okay and uh, <clears throat> then if work of breathing you see rocks work of breathing other things then py fsco okay you manage all those and when your rock score supports you you can go for de induction or you can go back to your hudson mask or if not then you have to go to higher form and if still you are not achieving and your patient is uh, coming to uh, ardi severe ardi then probably you have to again go for mechanical uh, ventilation so this is the crux of the story and uh, this i want to uh, so sorry this uh, small one minute video i want to show i hope i can play it so there uh, yeah it is now uh, thanks to my staff uh, my buddy uh, ajit and my sis our sister rani jaji and sister jess who gave their uh, full support and they worked day and night for months they stayed in the ward and we managed almost 74 in indoor covid patients and many of them were on uh, this uh, ben circuit and you can see i think the video has got some problem but here this particular patient i want to tell that he she was on 30 to 40 liter of oxygen with hfno and uh, she was uh, not doing at all well okay for days for 7 to 8 days then moment i shifted to ben circuit she was much stable with only 5 to 10 liter she could manage 94 to 95% of saturation so uh, unfortunately i am not able to show the video okay so that is the thing i'll see if yeah now i'll go to next slide just one second Slide. 
So, yeah, now we can see. Can you see? Yes, sir. Yeah, can you see? Yeah, we're able to see, but it's moving slowly. Yeah, yeah. That is basically uh, just. I, I want to demonstrate. Saturation improved to ninety-seven. This particular patient, very obese, had severe COVID. Her uh, CT severity index was almost twenty-four by twenty-five. And uh, now with the bench circuit, we are able to manage saturation of almost ninety-six to ninety-seven. And you can see. the hfno also was kept standby which did not work and she was grossly tachypneic also so thank you for that and uh, with that uh, i thank you all for listening to my talk on oxygenation in covid patients and uh, any queries or questions i'll try to resolve after uh, navin sir's talk and uh, thank you thank you dr datta that was very informative uh, you've been doing incredible work mm -hmm. at st john's hospital as we can all see uh, i'm glad you could throw some light on the niv bain circuit um, we here at kgh have also tried using it and uh, we echo your uh, uh, talk like uh, even we uh, could find uh the positive aspects of using the nib bain circuit like in terms of uh, oxygen conservation and also the patient benefiting from it so um one question that i would like to ask you myself uh, before moving on to the next talk is what were the major challenges that you had to face um in your setup at st ans during this year this pandemic year of yes, 2021 in covid 19 uh, last year versus this year both the time i was in charge and uh, there are uh, challenges on oxygenation challenges on medication being a physician my role is not limited to oxygenation also medication also last year we did not have uh, the uh, uh, we used remdesivir but it was purchased remdesivir this year we got uh, government supply remdesivir when i went to the literature of remdesivir it clearly says remdesivir is a dry crystalline powder to be reconstituted with 10 ml of ns and to be after that again to be mixed with 100 ml this time we got a already reconstituted uh, biosimilar uh, i should say biosimilar uh, remdesivir and to my knowledge and i have extensively used remdesivir this time okay man patients were also asking remdesivir like anything and being a government hospital lot of political pressure calls from ias officer calls from senior army officers that their relatives should be given remdesivir even in the opd basis which i refused and uh, you know the historic in came in the newspaper also the delhi army hospital research and referral the commandant who is himself a doyen of respiratory physician he has to resign from his post because of political pressure that he had to give remdesivir to the relatives in an opd basis so remdesivir this time did not work much i what i this thing if something has worked on medical side then even navin sir also knows that he is vouch for me methyl prednisolone work really wonderfully dexamethasone of course and methyl prednisolone that excellent drug and patients who were given oxygen therapy at the earliest were definitely uh, it, it saved their life who came very late or a decision taking process took more time okay there we lost and uh, early uh, what i uh, uh, this thing that early the patients who are also uh, who are doing more of proning discipline patient more of proning here probably one thought came to my mind that in covid management not allowing relatives probably is not a very good idea because we don't have that many healthcare workers so probably a good educated next of kin with a good pp should be allowed who should ensure that patient is on uh, prone position and should ensure that patient doesn't remove mask many a times the because of happy hypoxia patients were removing mask oxygen other things that was a big problem even 
during ward round like i i can only go three or four times to round other times the sisters and nurses are monitoring many times you see the patient without mask having saturation of 70 to 73 per hours or at night sudden emergencies and another this time we observe the disease is more more harsh the disease uh, the lung injury was much more faster and even on the day 4 or 5 of presentation patient had a fever or this thing of 6 or 7 days clinical symptom and they straight away came to opd with in a desaturated state which did not happen last year and of course lot of pulmonary fibrosis cases post this thing many discharges were on oxygen okay so uh, many discharges were on concentrator and uh, after discharge post discharge follow up also we saw and another thing rise in new onset diabetic okay new onset diabetics and worsening of diabetes those who are on oha they are on insulin and those who are not diabetic they become uh, this thing and another uh, typical finding i saw many of the deaths were of the age group of 40 to 50 and another uh, many of this uh, patient who died they had obesity is the biggest risk factor i saw even diabetes was not that challenging but obesity was really challenging young chap with abdominal obesity or gross obesity they had they had very worse outcomes so that is what is uh, my take other than that uh, of course uh, most of the antivirals or anti this thing i was uh, very happy with doxy azithromycin ivermectin and even uh flavi pravid okay despite of all the controversies it worked and it has been working so uh, remdesivir i was not very happy and uh, mixed cocktail i have not used i have used uh, uh, of course uh, monoclonal antibodies and uh, of course they were very late that time by the time used and uh, again uh, for pulmonary fibrosis we used in acetyl cysteine pirfenadine and uh, nintedanib this time also navin sir has been uh, my guru in that last year only he used however i found that if early we start it is useful this is good however in acetyl cysteine little economic and it is still working so uh, i am happy with that so uh, now uh, life is as you know post now it is most post covid challenge we are facing then covid so thanks that was my challenges and uh, issues in covid management thank you so much dr datta that was very informative at the grassroots level what you have been doing you truly are a one man army leading the sentans hospital at shri haripuram vaisag thank you so much we'll get back to you once we have more questions in the chat box uh, our second distinguished speaker today is dr ap navin dr navin uh, is an alumni of our andhra medical college batch 1981-86 he did his dnb general medicine from nizam's institute of medical sciences hyderabad he has numerous uh, research publications to his credit and uh, the most well notable amongst them is the thrombotic uh, thrombocytopenic purpura which he presented at present he is the chief specialist in vishaka steel plant general hospital at vishakhapatnam and uh, over to you dr navin yeah good morning everybody doc uh, thank you dr tripti for the uh, kind introduction can you hear me am i audible yes sir yes sir uh, yeah and good evening to everybody from the us if at all somebody has joined well at the outset i would like to thank professor sudhakar sir for giving me this opportunity to talk in this august forum and of course my gratitude to my colleague uh, Dr. Navin from the medicine department, who is always pushes me to present something or the other. Well, having heard uh, my good friend uh, Dr. Shambhudatta with his hi-fi uh, management of oxygen therapy, I would like to like to to bring bring you down down to the basics. Uh, and uh, my topic today is uh, vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia, which is VITT, or the vaccine-induced immune thrombocytopenia. well what made me uh, come into this uh, before we go to that this uh, this is the place where i work and most of my work has been done what most almost all my work has been done in vishaka steel general hospital and i owe everything what i have today to the patients who taught me during this 30 to 30 years which have been following on with this hospital well what made me uh, take up this topic is because i came across this patient about a week ago this 32 year old gentleman with no risk factors and he was vaccinated and with covid shield 
And two days later, he developed a rash on the left lower limb. And then later on, he developed the rash on the other limb also. Coincidentally, he had some body aches. He had burning sensation of the eyes and throat. And of course, he never had any other bleeding manifestations. And there was no headache, vomitings, or abdominal pain. And you can typically clearly see the petechial rash on the lower limb of this patient, which is light being fading off on the third day. This was taken on the next day. So these are the typical petechiae, which made us uh, stand up and see why this fellow has developed these uh, after a course of, uh, uh, after the vaccination. And we went into his past history. There were no history of similar rashes and he doesn't give any evidence of uh, uh, allergy to any other drugs. And of course, he never had any stigmata of any rheumatic heart disease. But coincidentally, we're, we're down the line, we need to look into it as uh, he, this fellow had malaria with thrombocytopenia in 2012. He says he had severe cerebral malaria and he was uh, sick and admitted and he came out of it. Similarly, in 2018, he had thrombocytopenia along with dengue. And of course, as I, as I said earlier, he never had any history of any drug intake. So the first and foremost thing is we started to investigate this guy and he had a hemoglobin which is normal. The total count was normal. But mind you, this is what uh, made us stand up again. That is the platelet count of 25,000. The, uh, the LFT, the RFT, the sugars, everything was normal. So with the platelet count of 25,000, now we came to the understanding that it is a vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia. So when we had this vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia, we went back and looked into what we have uh, to read regarding the vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia. So I would like you to briefly take you through whatever data we have, which is very limited regarding vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia. Uh, vaccination as far as COVID-19 has been most promising for ending or containing the COVID-19 pandemic. Mind you, there have been a lot of ins and outs in this pandemic and one of the, the topmost notch uh, which we came out very successfully, I think, thanks to the pharmaceutical companies, uh, is the availability of vaccine within a time frame of one year, which have proved to be very safe and effective. And how safe and effective is, uh, you can assess by the data which has been presented by UK. They said... One dose has effectively reduced hospitalization and death by 80%, greater than 80%. And in fact, most of my friends down there say that vaccination has done the trick because the number of hospital admissions have clearly come down. On the other hand, if my uh, US friends would watch, uh, hospitalization rates reduced to by 67% and 94% with single and dual vaccination respectively. And today we find that the US has opened up again and people are moving around with masks uh, and that is what I was looking for. If India can again reach that stage again with this vast population and the, the rate at which the vaccination is going on in our country, it is of course a Herculean task and the government is doing a yeoman service by trying to vaccinate everybody. Well, that is the effect of vaccination on this disease and I'm rightly sure that we are going forward. But however, there was a hitch in late February in 2021 when a prothrombotic syndrome was observed in a small group of individuals who received the AstraZeneca Oxford or the Serum Institute of India vaccine, which is an adenoviral vector-based vaccine. Subsequently, similar findings were observed in a small number of individuals who received the Jans Johnson & Johnson, the JJ shot, which is also based on an adenoviral vector. So this syndrome has been designated as the vaccine-induced immune thrombocytopenic purpura, but of course it's got various names like uh, thrombosis with thrombocytopenic syndrome, that is the TTS. And then we have the vaccine-induced prothrombotic immune thrombocytopenia, which is what is known as VIPIT. But for all practical purposes across the net, if you type vaccine-induced thrombogenic thrombocytopenia, you would get all the data you need regarding this uh, clinical entity. So why, when this thing has come up, we looked at the other vaccines. If you look at the other adenoviral vaccines, Without reported cases, we come across the CanSino Biologics uh, COVID-19 vaccine, and of course, the Gamalaya Institute Sputnik V and the Janssen Biologics. So it is unknown whether this represents a biological difference in vaccine safety due to different vaccine constituents, or is it a difference in reporting? Well, we have to take the, both of them with a pinch of salt. But the bottom line is, VITT has not been reported after mRNA-based COVID-19 vaccines. So that is a very important take-home message. 
So this is the, the comparative study which has been done by the cases which has been uh, registered, I think, until the end of May. You look at the UK cases and the US cases, uh, the, the about 309 UK and 28 US cases. And mind you, the first reported cases have come in from Europe around Norway and Greece, and later on the other cases also trickled in. If you look at the reporting rate, uh, the UK cases ranged from about six to 10%, whereas the US cases reported about three to 5%. And mind you, all of them have been with the first shot in the US and 95% with the first shot in the UK. The females age patients less than 50 and less than 70 doesn't hold much uh, option here because we're not having a fixed cohort everywhere. But what we need to look at is the cerebral venous thrombosis of 38% in the UK cases, where it is a whooping 80% in the US, US cases. But the bottom line is both these studies have shown a death rate of about 20%, uh, which is really a factor to look into. So what are the risk factors? The incidence of VIT is unknown, but it appears to be exceedingly rare. There's no doubt about it. However, with whatever cohort they have looked at, they found that the incidence is slightly more in the female sex and the younger age group is proposed to be possible risk factors associated with initial reports. But these associations may be screened by the demographics of early vaccinated population. But why I'll tell you this is because what they did is if you take Norway, they have given the older population the mRNA vaccines. But the younger population, especially the healthcare workers, have been given the AstraZeneca vaccine. Similarly, in different cohorts studied across the globe, the different people have been given different vaccines. And maybe that's the reason why you might have a younger age group or a female preponderance. But however, if a, a study where everybody has been vaccinated, then we can have a better demographic profile. So if you look at the epidemiology of VIT, the annual incidence of uh, the either isolated idiopathic thrombocytic pinpura or cerebral sinus venous, thin, uh, sinus venous uh, thrombosis is higher. But when adjusted for the two-week frame rates, they're much lower. The, the, the data which shows that this was done by Gautami Arapeli et al. from the Duke University, US, uh, which showed that the annual incidence of ITP is about 16 to 39 million. But when you come up to this two-week period, it drops down to only about 0.6 to 1.5. Same is the case with CSVT. 13 to 20 per million annual incidence, but it is 0.5 to 0.7. Now, if you look at the idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura and mRNA levels, the incidence is about 0.8 to 1 per million. Mind you, they do not have any uh, VITTs with the mRNA vaccines. So what is this VITT? Is an immune complication resembling a variant of autoimmune heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. All of us are aware of the hit. And so we are also aware of the autoimmune hit. So it is just an immune complication resembling that. It is unlikely a byproduct of COVID-19 infection because a lot of data has shown when people are having COVID-19 infection, the PF4 antibody assays has been very less, especially when the COVID-19 had a lot of thrombotic complications and they received heparin. They did the PF4 antibodies, which are the hallmark of VITT, and they were, they were not at that level to show that this is the cause. So it is independent of anti-SARS-CoV uh, protective immunity. So it is not dependent on the protective immunity. It is independent one. So it is an autoimmune uh, reaction which is going in certain individuals, which is precipitating this uh, uh, VITT. If you look at the pathophysiology, as I've been talking about, it is caused by antibodies that recognize the platelet factor four, which is bound to the platelets. Now, we know this platelet factor 4 has got some 100 or more uh, uh, components in it. Uh, these antibodies are immunoglobulins that activate the platelets via low affinity platelet uh, FCY2A receptors, which are the receptors on the platelet surface that bind the FC portion of the IgG. This is a simple like an idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura where the immunoglobulins attach onto the platelets and they're sculpted by the spleen and so the destruction occurs. So ultimately, the platelet activation and plausibly activation of other cells such as the neutrophils results in marked stimulation of the coagulation system and clinically significant thromboembolic phenomena uh, complications set up uh, uh, in these patients. So what are, what are the VITT antibodies? They are an IgG class, as I've told you. They recognize the PF4 bound to the platelets and they're detectable in PF4 polyanion and PF4 enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays and in functional assays. Mind you, if you look at the, uh, the immunoturbidometric methods or the chemiluminescent methods, these uh, PF4 
uh, uh, antibodies are not picked up. You need very sensitive ELISAs or functional assays to detect these uh, antibodies. And of course, they cause platelet activation and they are not heparin dependent. Unlike the uh, hep hit heparin induced thrombocytopenia, they are not heparin dependent and that is why the variant of, uh, it's equivalent to the variant, that is the autoimmune hit, uh, which is equivalent. So the mechanism of development of new antibodies is not known. The possibility is the components of the vaccine, including the virus proteins in the free DNA, bind to the PF4 and generate a neoantigen. And this is the reason why they produce this immune complexes. It is unknown which of the greater than 1,000 protein components in the vaccine may play a role in platelet activation. Maybe down the line, if a molecular biologist can look into it, they might pinpoint it to one of the proteins which is present in these vaccine, which is responsible for this immune reaction. The key feature that distinguishes VIT from other thrombocytopenic disorders is uh, the anti-PF4 antibodies in these disorders are able to activate platelets and cause thrombosis. Mind you, they activate the platelets and initiate the coagulation system and they cause extensive thrombosis. However, in ITP and other antiplatelet antibodies, they bind to the platelets but do not cause platelet activation and hence do not cause thrombosis. So that's the difference between an ITP and a VITP. Because this differentiation is very, very important because if you do not make this uh, differentiation and start treatment early, the, the mortality rate and the morbidity rate in these patients would increase. So what are the clinical features? The syndrome likely billings, uh, uh, belong, uh, uh, starts off with a narrow window period of 5 to 10 days post-vaccination, leading to identification of cases typically between 5 to 30 days. All of them present with flu-like symptoms. You have to be very careful. Thrombocytopenia, particular mucosal bleeding, or routine CBC shows decreased platelets from 10,000 to 1 lakh. As in our case, uh, this patient had PTK, and of course, we went for a C uh, CBC, and it showed 25,000. Some individuals with VITT may have a platelet count out this, outside this range, which uh, includes uh, if the patient, if you have caught the patient a little early, if he's come with the flu-like symptoms, his platelets are normal, and he might be in the process of a decreasing platelet count. On the other hand, uh, an individual might have very high platelet count and for whom a count of 1,20,000 may represent a significant decrease. So you need to monitor the platelet counts periodically if you think that the patient is having a VITT. So what is the, uh, depending upon the site of thrombosis, you have typical symptoms. Now, the sites of thrombosis in VIT, VITT is atypical. Now, the characteristic sites of thrombosis you get in HIT uh, or uh, any other thrombotic thing is the pulmonary vessels and then you have the DVT, the, the DVT of the legs. But however, in BITT, you have the cerebral veins and the dural venous sinuses. So any patient who comes in of severe headache, he has vomitings, blurring of vision, focal neurological deficits or an encephalopathy following on vaccination, do think of BITT and go for a specific uh, uh, imaging of the brain. Similarly, if the patient is complaining of severe abdominal pain, especially the back pain, and the patient is looking toxic and he has hemodynamic compromise. Do think of splanchnic veins, especially the splenic vein, the portal vein, the renal vein, or the adrenal veins can be affected in these patients. And see, you need to get a CT contrast with abdomen, uh, CT contrast with the abdomen. DVT, everybody knows. Pulmonary embolism, I do not need to explain. One more aspect is the ophthalmic vein thrombosis, where the patients can complain with orbital pain. Now, most of the patients who are coming to our uh, OPDs nowadays are with orbital pain. But mind you, they're all coming with thinking that they have got mucor. But as a clinician, you need to keep your eyes open and think whether it is VITT because sudden uh, severe orbital pain or diplopia or vision loss can be a thrombosis of the ophthalmic vein. And you can salvage this patient if you do an appropriate uh, uh, MRI and a, magne a magnetic resonance venography, you can pick up the thrombosis in the ophthalmic vein. Ischemic stroke, the patient presents with the uh, deficit, so it's not a problem. Acute limb ischemia, look, look at pain in the limbs, pulseless pallor, and neurological deficits, uh, then you wouldn't be missing the limb. Thrombosis occurs both at the venous and the arterial line. If you look at patient with headache, you have CSVT, you need to do the PF4 antibody and I'd say whether it is VITT. Then you have 
this planktonic circulation, as I've told you, this planktonic circulation can affect the portal vein or the uh, mesenteric vein. But one aspect is the adrenal vein thrombosis. The adrenal vein thrombosis can cause severe abdominal pain and vomiting. Sometimes it can be bilateral and the patient can present in severe shock. That is a severe adrenal vein failure. So if any patient comes with severe abdominal pain and bilateral and shock, do think that it could be an adrenal vein thrombosis. Pulmonary is less common. Arterial, we've already talked. These patients can have sudden death. That is because of the coronary thrombosis or an intracerebral hemorrhage or a massive pulmonary embolism. If you look at the coagulation abnormalities, a routine test might show to moderate to severe thrombocytopenia. But if you do a D-dimer, the D-dimers are deranged quite drastically. Usually they are in the range of more than 10,000. And if you look at the fibrinogen, about half of them would have a fibrinogen level below the normal range. The PET and APTT can be normal or mildly, mildly increased, but they do not have any clinical significance as such. If you look at the bleeding, often bleeding predominates in acute DIC, whereas in VITT, it is the thrombosis which predominates. Now, hemorrhage is a frequent manifestation of cerebral sinus venous thrombosis in the absence of anticoagulation due to venous condition. Now, we are in a fixer when the patient has a CSVT and a bleed, whether you would like to give them heparin, uh, what you call uh, non-anticoagulation, uh, uh, because that's very, very important. In fact, you need to give the anticoagulation to these patients in order to control the sinus venous thrombosis and automatically the intracerebral hemorrhage would come down. Well, you can have an isolated thrombocytopenia without thrombosis and hemorrhage has also been repeated, but these patients have a very high D-dimer. So if you have an isolated thrombocytopenia, very high D-dimers, and you do not have evidence of thrombosis, you need to give an anticoagulant because these patients can manifest with the thrombotic complications if you don't give it now. And of course, the minor breathing, bleeding that is bruising and petit care also very common. So if you want to know the difference between ITP, TTP, and VITT, all of them have thrombocytopenia. Thrombosis is seen in VITT, whereas typically uh, in thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, it is a microvascular uh, a thrombosis, which you see, which is uh, known as my microvascular autoimmune hemolytic anemia or MAHA. So uh, the uh, clinical features are you have petechia and purpura as in our case. Here you have a hemolytic uremic like syndrome where the patients can present with neurological manifestations, kidney or cardiac involvement. Here we already saw that the fibrinogen will be low and the D-dimers are very high. Here all the parameters would be normal, whereas in TP. A TTP, you have the typical schistocytes in the peripheral smear. The LDH would be very high. The fibrinogen would be normal. The D-dimer would be normal. But the typical peripheral smear of MAHA, that is what I told you, microvascular autoimmune, autoimmune hemolytic anemia is very much there. You have a positive anti-PF4 antibody by the ELISA. It is a diagnosis of exclusion. Whereas here you have the ADMNTC uh, deficiency, which is less than 10%. Of course, the management, it all differs. The plasma pheresis is the treatment in TTP. Here you give either immunoglobulin or steroids. Here we'll talk about it a little later. So when to suspect, when to suspect a VITT? These are the, this is the mnemonic of uh, four uh, uh, Vs. That is, uh, the vaccine is given, that the interval is five to 30 degrees post-vaccine. Then you have the thrombosis. Usually the event draws attention to the thing. So you have the vaccine, the interval, the thrombosis, and finally thrombocytopenia, usually recognized when a complete blood count is uh, done to investigate the thrombosis. Less often, it is incidentally detected also. So then you have the score, the 4T score. Of course, this 4T score is validated for HIT, but however, this is a slightly variant of it. This score has not been validated, but down the line, maybe we have better scores to validate. But as of now, we are taking this score to see what are the chances of this patient having a VITT. The first is thrombocytopenia, 10 to 99% it is two, less than 10%, uh, 10,000 or more than one lakh, it is one, the platelet count of more than 150, then it's zero. The timing is five to 14 days post vaccine, it's two, 15 to 30 days is one, zero to four days very early, or more than 30 days, it's zero. Thrombosis, definite thrombosis, the D-dimers more than 10,000, it's two, between 2,000 to 10,000, you give a 1 and no thrombosis and D-dimer less than 2,000, you give a 0. Now, the other causes of thrombosis the thrombocytopenia, if they're not evident, you give a 2. If it's possible, it's 1 and definite is a 0. 
So the interpretation is if you've got a score of zero to three, it is low probability. Four to five points, intermediate probability. Six to eight points, it's high probability. Let's look at our case. We had about uh, 10,000, uh, 25,000. So we get a score of two there. This is less than five days. So we get a zero. Thrombosis, D dimers, zero. The other causes are not evident because we did all these tests. So you get a two. So we got a score of four, where is an intermediate probability? It's about three to four. So it's an intermediate probability if you take this score validated to our case. So uh, now with this background of VITT, do you advocate platelet uh, uh, this thing count uh, uh, estimation and DDMS for all patients? The routine testing of platelet counts following COVID-19 vaccination is not suggested due to the rarity of the syndrome. D-dimer testing should not be performed for screening given its lack of specificity. So in the absence of symptoms, in the absence of clinical features, why do you need to do a platelet test or a D-dimer on these patients? Testing for infection is reasonable to exclude the possibility of COVID-19 hypercoagulable state. Now, this is the, the crunch of it. If the patient has high-grade fever, if he's having body pains, then do test for a COVID-19 infection because it could be a hypercoagulable state if you, and if you... Uh, examine and uh, treat the case accordingly, you're doing more justice to him. And in fact, uh, we have a lot of patients who, who come with breakthrough infection uh, when, when they go for this uh, COVID-19 vaccination. So as far as lab testing is concerned, you need a complete blood picture. You need to do a coagulation testing that is the PT and APTT, fibrinogen and D-dimer. And they the test send as far as India is concerned because the PF4 antibody testing ELISA is the recommended screening. You need to do a PF4 antibody testing. Unfortunately, I've been trying to try to get this test done in Vizac, which is not available. You need to do a functional assays like the serotonin release assay, which are more positive. But uh, the, the amount of optical density readings uh, in uh, uh, VITT is quite high. means they are more than two. You don't see such high levels of functional assays uh, uh, with SRA with uh, either HIT or the other thrombotic complications uh, where, do you where you find this PF4 antibodies. Now, if the ELISA is positive, then you don't need to do the functional assays. But however, if you strongly suspect that it is a case of VITT and your ELISA for PF4 antibody testing is negative, then you can go for functional assays such as the serotonin release assay. Now, as I've told you, the turbidometric methods or the chemiluminescent techniques are not very useful for PF4 antibody testing because they're not very sensitive. Now, the rapid hit assays negative generally are not advocated. They are negative generally and they're not advocated. So please do not do the rapid hit assays. You need to do the ELISA-based techniques. So coming back to our case, we had this patient of 25,000. So what did we do? We, did, we went and did the first D-dimer, which was normal. PTINR and APTT were normal. Then the fibrinogen was normal. And the other workups such as the ANA, HA, and the viral markers were negative. And then we went and did an MRI brain, which shows that there's no evidence of any emboli, infarcts or hemorrhages anywhere. Then we did a venogram, which showed that all the veins are very clean. So there are no embolic manifestations. Uh, so we looked at the brain. You might ask me why we didn't do an abdomen because the fellow doesn't have any abdominal pain. It doesn't have any vomitings. And of course, the other limbs, the other circulations are all oh, well. So when you have this, uh, what is the differential diagnosis? The first thing is, is it COVID-19 and infections like malaria, uh, uh, NS1, that is the uh, dengue infection, as Dr. Shambhu was saying, the dengue infections have increased recently. So we need to do the NS1s. ITP is a very strong possibility. Look, you need to look at the patient, whether he has some hypersplenism. And of course, a variety of things, such as the drugs, trauma, surgery, pregnancy, because these are all the places where secondary thrombosis can occur. And of course, you need to rule out thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura and the classic HIT if the patient has been exposed to heparin, but this patient had no exposure to heparin. So if you look at the, the algorithm, the signs and symptoms concerning for thrombosis within three weeks of vaccination, you do a CBC, D-dimer, and fibrinogen. If the tests are normal, the VITT is unlikely. You don't need to continue workup. And if the patient has symptoms, you need to continue. However, if there is only isolated thrombocytopenia, then consider vaccine-induced ITP if no thrombosis is identified. But however, if the thrombocytopenia is associated with high d dimer levels and low fibrinogen, then your diagnosis of BITT is confirmed. So irrespective of thrombosis, mind you, irrespective of thrombosis, hospitalize and treat with non-heparin, anticoagulant, and plus IVG 
until the platelets recover because you need to hit them hard and very early to prevent any thrombotic or embolic manifestations from occurring. So this is another flow diagram. Symptoms of thrombosis for following COVID-19 vaccination, do, uh, whether it is uh, uh, what vaccine has been taken within 5 to 30 days, CBC with complete, PTA, PTT, same, appropriate testing for thrombosis. So if the patient has normal platelet and negative thrombosis, so it is not suspected. Thrombosis, thrombocytopenia and thrombosis, this is a very high suspicion for VITT. And so you need to do the appropriate PF4 antibody testing and start empirical treatment without waiting for the result to come. Thrombocytopenia without thrombosis, as is the case in our patient, this could be ITP. So you need to start treatment for ITP. Thrombosis without thrombocytopenia. Now this is the crime situation. The, there is thrombosis, but you do not have thrombocytopenia. So it can be other factors such as uh, trauma, cancer, or thrombophilia that is uh, TTP. So, or it can be uh, any of the other manifestations where thrombosis can occur. So in, your options are wide open. You need to further investigate the patient. So as far as management recommendations are concerned, they are rapidly evolving because it's a new topic. Anticoagulation is the uh, treatment of choice. Therapeutic anticoagulation is one of the primary treatments for VITT and is used unless there is a contraindication such as an expanding intracerebral hemorrhage, a huge hemorrhage which is expanding. You need to be in close consult uh, with your neurosurgical and the neurophysician colleagues uh, because uh, it's like a double-edged sword. You need to give uh, patients uh, anticoagulation, but of course, if it is increasing, then you have to take it uh, uh, the advantages and the disadvantages. Well, it is unknown whether heparin or low molecular weight apparently is safe or effective deleterious, but the early reports describe clinical worst, including death. And so as of now, today we are not advocating low molecular weight heparin or heparin in these patients. So given the similarity to autoimmune-induced heparin-induced uh, thrombocytopenia, most experts caring for the initial patients suggest using a non-heparin anticoagulant. So the verdict is out. In these patients, you need to use a non-heparin anticoagulant. So the choice is you have a direct oral anticoagulants. The options are you better use an anti-factor A, inhibit anti 10 a uh, factor such as epixaban or rivaroxaban. Now with the advent of COVID-19, we're well, well versed with it. I think the safest best would be to use an epixaban or rivaroxaban. Oral direct thrombin inhibitors such as dabigatran, we have very few uh, uh, condition, uh, cases who have been studied with this. It is less studied, but of course, it's a poor man's uh, uh, direct acting uh, oral anticoagulant drug. So in the Indian setup, you can give dabigatran also. Fondoparanix, yes, is, uh, danaparide is not available here. I you can use it. A parental direct thrombin inhibitor is used in very severe conditions such as uh, uh, bivalirudine. We, uh, at least I do not have any, but this is what the, the studies say that you can use argetroban or bivalirudine. So the duration of treatment, the appropriate duration of anticoagulation is unknown, but however, whenever the patient has a VITT, the optimum treatment would be for about three months after normalization of the platelet count. So for VITT, you don't have thrombosis, but you have a high DDAMA levels and the platelets are decreased. Anticoagulation is continued until the platelet count recover and perhaps longer for about four to six weeks appears prudent. But what most of the studies say is, uh, what are the most of the reviews and articles say is, you need to closely follow up these patients who have thrombocytopenia and coagulation profile abnormality with no thrombosis because you might have caught them a little early. And so it's nothing wrong if the D-dimers do not fall back to normal levels uh, to continue the anticoagulation for at least two to three months. Individuals who are discharged from the hospital can be switched to oral DOICs. They're taking a parental anticoagulant in the hospital. Now, a word about the warfarin and other vitamin K antagonists. They should be avoided while the patient is thrombocytopenic. There's no doubt about it due to lack of efficacy during the ongoing hemostatic activation. But VK uh, can be an option following platelet count recovery for the individual who's unable to receive a DOIC. So mind you, is unable to receive a DOIC, then you can go for vitamin K antagonist. But uh, uh, as of now, a DOIC would be an appropriate choice for patients whom you are discharging from the hospital. Then comes the IVIG. Now, the IVIG is the life-saving drug. It is a high-dose intravenous immune goblin. It is recommended along with anticoagulation as a means of in interrupting the VITT antibody-induced platelet activation. So if you give the immunoglobulins, the antibody-induced platelet activation would come down significantly. 
A typical dose is one milligram per kg intravenously. You give once for two days only. That is the advocated dosage for IVAG. As far as transfusions are concerned, it's a big no. Platelet transfusions are generally reserved only for critically bleeding patients with a critical anatomic site or causes hemodynamic or respiratory compromise, or if the patient needs to go for an emergency surgery, then you need to give platelet transfusion. Otherwise, try to avoid transfusions. In such cases, you may be reasonable to transfuse platelets and a source of fibrin. The best is the cryoprestate, depending on the platelet count and the fibrinogen level. And as I've said, platelet transfusions are to be minimized to avoid worsening thrombosis. As far as monitoring is concerned, you need to do a platelet monitoring daily after discharge periodically as they can decrease when IVIG is stopped. PT, APT, and D dimer should be monitored only if they're abnormal or you have a condition where there is no uh, thrombosis, there is thrombocytopenia and the patient is symptomatic. Maybe you can repeat uh, a D dimer maybe after three to five days to see whether it is normal or increasing. So when to discharge the patient? We should continue inpatient management until all of the following occur. If the platelet count is more than 50,000 improving, uh, for at least two to three days, you can discharge. The patient is on stable anticoagulant with no new or progressive thrombosis, then you can send him home. And of course, if there's no bleeding for at least two to three days and appropriate follow-up and mind you, long-term follow-up and mind you, uh, biochemical monitoring follow-up also is very much required in these patients, unlike uh, the other patients. So there's been a lot of myths uh, whether there is any role of aspirin in preventing VITT. There's definitely no role. Patients in aspirin, you can continue. Well, the selection of the vaccine choice is individualized. We don't like to <clears throat> comment on this. Persons who have received one dose, there is no data to say you need to omit the next dose of an AstraZeneca or the j, &J vaccine because the data clearly says that you do not need to omit or change your vaccine. As far as our patient was concerned, we managed the patient with steroids and supportive treatment. And as you can see in three days time, the platelet count has improved to 1.3 lakhs and we have discharged this patient. So post-vaccination, immune thrombocytopenia, the cases of apparent secondary immune thrombocytopenia after SARS-CoV vaccination with both the Pfizer and the Moderna M vaccines have been recently reported. So immune thrombocytopenia is common. As I told you, 0.5 to 1 is the incidence of immune thrombocytopenia following the vaccines. So you need to have a look into patients who have come with a platelet counts on the lower side. It is still whether unclear whether this relationship between the coronavirus vaccination and thrombocytopenia is coincidental or casual. We need larger studies. The mechanism of post-vaccination thrombocytopenia is also presumed to be immune-mediated, and so that's the reason why it responds very well to either the immunoglobulins or to the corticosteroids. Favorable response is noted in most of the patients treated with corticosteroids and IVIG. So to summarize, what I can say is many things are unknown. They still remain unknown regarding VITT and uh, the studies are evolving. The management strategies are evolving. The treatment modalities and the investigations are uh, evolving and it may shift our correct understanding so whatever I have taught, I've told you today might change tomorrow. Do not have clarity on the incidence of the disease and the impact on the age, gender, and race. Whether the class effects are related to the DNA cargo contaminants, the adenovirus itself is also unknown at this time. A number of questions remain about the PF4's causative role in the immune response and identification of biomarkers and our genetic susceptibility that could portend thrombotic risk. So you need to know a lot more about this. So I would like to conclude saying vaccination still remains the primary means of preventing SARS-CoV infection curbing the COVID-19 pandemic. This is very clear. The risk of life-threatening thrombosis from COVID-19 greatly exceeds the risk of VITT. So mind you, just thinking of VITT, we should not stop people from getting the vaccine done. We should be aware of this syndrome, but we should not prevent people from getting the vaccine. And of course, there are known, known preventive strategies for VITT. So ladies and gentlemen, this is what the bird's view of Vizac from our uh, hilltop, that is the AMC. This is what we have right now regarding VITT. And I do not know how crystal clear like this image here, we would be evolving in due course as far as VITT is concerned. Thank you very much for your patient hearing.
Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Uh, I absolutely agree with you on this, that uh, the need of the other is vaccination for one and all. Um, your lecture was very informative. It was in insightful, I'm sure. Uh, it was very useful to all the uh, audience, the practitioners, as well as the students here. Uh, I believe we have some questions in the chat box. We are running out of time. So let us directly go to the Q&A session. Uh, I believe our principal, Dr. P.V. Sudhakar, had raised his hand. Sir, yeah. you have yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Tripti, thank you very much. Thank you, Naveen, for that um, extensive and, you know, uh, bringing out something new, uh, which needs to be looked into. But, you know, I wanted to ask a few questions, but uh, they were all answered during your uh, uh, lecture. Uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to ask you about what happened to your patient that you have already answered. And I wanted to know as to what the status of uh, the uh, VITT now throughout the world. That also you have answered that there is no exact data available yes, of its incidents. So, so thank you very much. So nice of you. And uh, you, Pripti, you may go, yeah, you may go ahead with the rest of the questions in the chat box. Thank you. So we have our, uh, in the chat box, we have our past national ISA president, Dr. Chakra Rao Garu. He has, uh, he has something to convey to all of us. It's, it's about the Bain and NIV circuit, I believe we have been using. He says that uh, we need about 70 ml per kg per minute. And um, uh, obviously, uh, we have to see that the, uh, the flow of oxygen, we have to put, uh, we have to put around, uh, use around one and a half times the minute volume. Absolutely agree with you on this, sir. And uh, then we have Dr. Kurnat, Kalepuli Kurnat, sir. So, uh, sir has been my teacher during my postgraduate uh, years and he has a word of caution that we have to monitor the partial pressure of carbon dioxide as well. I absolutely agree with uh, you on this. So I have a question to pose uh, to Dr. Uh, Surgeon Captain Dr. Shambhu Datta. Uh, sir, uh, Dr. Yes. Datta, I so I would like to ask you on behalf of all of us uh, here. Uh, what are the precautions that you would take while you have put a patient on NIV Bain's coaxial circuit and what are the instructions you would give to your ward staff while the patient is on NIV Bain's? Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. That was a very practical and prudent question. Even uh, the standard protocol when we are uh, switching over to Bain circuit, uh, in a refractory case, normally all my Ben circuit indications were the patients who were refractory to NIV or HFNO. I did not use primarily as such. So that itself was a great number. Almost 27 uh, 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 patients came into that category. And I had a thorough uh, instruction, strict instruction that, uh, uh, that uh, SpO2 should be monitored, not with the finger uh, probe, but with the proper SpO2, uh, like ICU uh, probes we used and second uh, at least in a day we uh, tried to see the ETCO or one ABG because we are a resource force setting patient could not afford that much but we had a thorough check on CO2 okay and second uh, most of the patients were uh, very hypoxemic without support so we used to be very careful while feeding the patient or giving some oral drugs to the patient while removing the mask and uh, which was little uh, difficult, which I felt. So uh, I had a given a strict instruction while removing the mask, NIV mask in Ben, the, uh, a senior uh, nursing staff or a senior uh, respiratory assistant should be present. And uh, that was because uh, many of the patients they desaturated suddenly the moment we removed for even seconds. So that was one of these things. And even uh, when circuit, uh, my uh, a good uh, uh, hope of uh, this hopeful sentence is that many Ben circuit patients who we thought that we can't salvage out, even they become discharged also after good 10 to 12 days of Ben circuit. So that shows that it is not that uh, uh, much, uh, having that much problem with a uh, lot of literatures against it or 
so and uh, there are of course now lot of literatures are coming in india especially though internationally there are as i told only a spanish literature is there and uh, co2 retention may not be a big issue okay but we have to also see as quickly as possible we should uh, de induct the vein circuit if we see the patient is gradually uh, reduction in oxygen requirement is maintaining saturation and as the spo2 is going up above 96 with decreasing oxygen demand then we should switch over to primarily to a niv and then to a hudson mask and abruptly we should not switch over to a nasal prong from vein circuit so that is my uh, take uh, on messages thank you dr datta so what we have been doing here is i understand your problem that the moment we remove the vein circuit or the niv mask we have this problem of desaturation so most of the times we have a hfno standby which we plug into the patient's uh, uh, nose uh, and uh, you know make the patient feel comfortable so his uh, he's free to eat and uh, drink so that is how we go about um, sorry to interrupt we have dr malam malam palli who has raised his hand please go ahead Uh, hello good morning everyone um, a beautiful talk by dr sambudatta and also navin who is my good friend of andhra medical college and we work together as well in the uh, steel plant um one question to dr datta is um, what's your data about um, the vein circuit in how many cases that you have used and what's the success rate and uh, what is the failure rate and how did you measure the failure um any more data that you can uh, yeah. show which is very good uh, interesting i feel it's a very safe and uh, cheap economically to use especially in situations like uh, india with uh, at least it's still recovering now um so i'm just more interested in on the data base uh, if you have uh, Uh, of elaboration on that yes sir professor uh, yes sir uh, yes sir professor thank you sir for very nice question and i have uh, uh, already put up a paper is actually i treated 27 persons uh, on uh, vein circuit and all my vein circuit indications were pr primarily because uh, patients were uh, was not able to maintain saturation despite of uh, niv and hfno also many of the patients they were recovering 30 to 40 liter hfno so we switched over to this experiment this thing and uh, out of 27 uh, we had of course uh, one death definitely young and uh, he was not doing well his ct score was also 24 but 25 i told he was a young 44 years very obese guy diabetic and another patient because uh, they were financially a bit much stronger than most of our other patients so on day 15 they wanted to shift to a higher center because they uh, thought that invasive ventilation would have would help and uh, i have a limited invasive ventilation capacity because i have got only uh, right now left with only one ventilator uh, out of two one has been given to government so uh, and that is other ventilator is for non covid and i don't have a respiratory therapist or don't so uh, they suggested that they want to go to a higher center of tertiary hospital very big hospital in vijayak so i had sent the patient with ben circuit on with my respiratory therapist and uh, unfortunately what happened uh, the patient reached there and while switching over from ben circuit to invasive he died there collapsed within 5 minutes he dropped dead so that was the outcome and relatives also later on they told that uh, probably ben circuit would have pulled him out i did not comment because uh, he had already on day 14 of ben circuit and the uh, problem is uh, when we are on this high end this thing ben circuit or niv patient requires uh, high oxygen when we are switching over we should be very careful while switching over to mechanical ventilation because patients desaturate within moments i have seen even just for changing over or cleaning the mouth oral cavity for 1 or 10 or 15 seconds patient desaturate and can go into uh, acute respiratory arrest so that is the this thing otherwise results were very good and uh, mostly the ben circuit patients became okay within 4 or 5 days then switched over to uh, mask ventilation or uh, nasal prong and uh, with uh, another 4 or 5 days many of them were wind off and some of them of course with advanced pulmonary fibrosis had gone on discharge with sir 
oxygen at home or oxygen concentrator at home but generally outcome was good yeah have you used this as just as a rescue therapy or uh, have you used it in place of niv or until no, you sir. obtain an niv bed sir uh, when i started reading this from the article uh, from the uh, journals and then when i called my colleagues at gujarat and maharashtra those who are working in resource poor i told this is a problem look i have got niv and hfno but i am not, and uh, nrbm but i am not able to manage the oxygen so they told sir you try with this so i tried my first one or two cases then three four and uh, daily i used to chat them i used to ask them for instructions and they used to help me and uh, i had almost a uh, whatsapp group with uh, this uh, people who are using ben circuit regularly in rajkot and in madhya pradesh chatisgarh and uh, some of them in maharashtra nasik is extensively used many peripheral hospital they used and uh, also in our army base hospital ben circuit was used so extensively so uh, i was in uh, communication and all difficulties i used to express so mostly my patients whom i used they were initially on nrbm followed by niv and then still if their saturation is dropping below 80 84 then i started and one wonder this thing the moment you, i have got videos also i cannot share two three uh, because of this technical hitch otherwise you can see the uh, increase of the saturation is within moments the moment you start and with the less oxygen suppose patient is on 30 to 40 liter of oxygen in hfno moment you switch over to ben you start with 10 liter or 15 liter you so the spo2 monitor starts increasing within 5 to 10 minutes and it will uh, go till 93 94 within few minutes only and uh, then it persists and even patients respiratory effort you can see reduces rr reduces respiratory rate reduces okay so all these thing even uh, rocks the value i calculated for few of them uh, for my data this thing a rocks also uh, was favorable and uh, 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 patients uh, outcome profile was generally good but the death attributable one or two which, which i told was not because of ben circuit it was because the patient itself presented very late with severe pulmonary fibrosis and uh, one was even tried for mechanical ventilation he died other one of course uh, he died in ben but is kind of, he was 85 years old with comorbidity of severe obesity diabetes so he was not at all uh, doing well from the beginning so that was this otherwise rest around 25 cases they did very well and uh, response was within 4 to 5 days most of them thank you so much <laughs> I, i agree on almost all that you have said even we here at uh, kgh we have uh, used the circuit what we did was like you have said we have uh, used almost uh, double the tidal uh, minute volume of the patient uh, used about 10 to 15 liters and that conserved a lot of oxygen Uh, firstly and secondly what we did was uh, we had the apl valve of the vein circuit half closed so that the patient the rebreathing of carbon dioxide wouldn't occur we also have done serial abgs for the patient and we did not find any hypercarbia in most of the patients and um, on top of that most of the patients they also felt very comfortable using the niv vein circuit as compared to the Uh, NIV mask, uh, non-invasive ventilation alone. So the comfort factor was also there. I, I understand the problem of desaturation, which you have been talking about, and that we addressed with a standby HFNO while eating or drinking. So that is uh, that was very informative. Thank you, Dr. Datta. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Uh, Navin, uh, Dr. Kumar. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Rajeshekar. He, uh, okay, uh, from. Dr Raj Shekhar and he has uh, posted Yeah I can read it. Do uh, you differentiate uh, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia due to covid-19? Yeah that's uh, that's what, what I told in my uh, presentation is uh, that uh, whenever you have this uh, uh, symptoms of flu like or thrombocytopenia maybe after 15 or 20 days after vaccination the first thing you should do is uh, do a uh, Uh, rt pcr to rule out a covid-19 infection so you need to do a uh, uh, rt pcr to rule out an infection because uh, uh, it can be because of a covid infection also but however the thrombosis component is much much more common with the covid-19 and of course uh, 
if you have, uh, if you can do, what are the differences which have been done is the PF4 antibody test would not be uh, positive in these patients, uh, uh, whereas in BITT it would be positive. But of course, that's down the line. The first thing is you need to do an RT-PCR and, and say that this patient is not having uh, a COVID-19 infection. That's very, very important. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. We have our eminent pulmonologist, Dr. Prem, sir, with us. He has a question to pose. Sir, please. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Tripti, and uh, wonderful lectures by Sambudatta and uh, Naveen. <coughs> uh, actually, I have two comments to make. Normally, am I audible, Tripti? Yes, yes, sir. You, you are audible. Actually, in the respiratory support, we deal with two things. One is oxygenation and another is CO2 removal. So for oxygenation, we require a PEEP and for CO2 removal, we need a pressure support, which, enhance, which augments the minute volume. So here in Bain's circuit with the half closed APL valve, it offers some PEEP. So that's why the FRC is increased. Some of the collapsed alveoli will be opening and the oxygenation is improved. But we should keep in one thing in mind that if the we have to observe the work of the breathing. If the patient is tiring, work of breathing is increasing. So it indicates to us that it is a re impending respiratory failure and we need to support the tiring muscles. So to support the tiring muscles, we need a pressure support. So in such cases, we have to be very cautious and go for a bypass where we will get both CPAP, that is P for oxygenation and pressure support for, uh, you know, the tiring muscles. This is what I would like to add. And simply, if the cause of um, COVID pneumonia, majority are ground glass. Ground glass means the compliance is good. That's why they are not tiring. That's why we call it as a happy hypoxemia. The compliance is good. That's why most of the people of a ground glass opacity might come out good with uh, your, uh, you know, vein. But if there are extensive consolidations that indirectly a surrogate marker for the reduced compliance, where the vein circuit may not be useful because the compliance would be low and you can go for a bypass. Just you can have a study for consolidation and for GG. So, that, that shows, sorry. Um... Dr. Narvin talk. So the vaccine induced thrombocytopenia, earlier it was said only females and then young women and then 18 to 50 and then they came to 32 to 53 like that. And you know, the you please uh, mute your... They have published data and in Canada, the AstraZeneca Aqu what we are using, the COVID-19 vaccine, yeah. vaccine yeah. Uh, they, they reserved it only for aged more than 55 years. 55, yeah. Now they got in 72-year-old man, 68-year-old man. So uh, the sex reservation was not there and even age was also not restricted. Yes. Yeah. So we have to compare the homogeneous populations. So to whom... I agree. Given. Yeah, the, so the demography is across uh, all the age groups. Then we will know whether there yes. is a particular preponderance to a particular group. Now we yes. came to know from the Canada results that it can occur even in elderly, in age even in a males also. That's it. Yeah. And yeah, you know, definitely in Canada, they apart from these IVIG uh, for one or two cases, they did thirteen plasma exchanges to remove the wit antibodies. Antibodies. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Premi, I think you're absolutely right there. When I said the demographic profile is not correct now, we can't take it uh, right now like that. Because even in the Norway study also, they found more it in this uh, workers, uh, the, uh, what do you call the healthcare workers, because uh, the AstraZeneca was given in this. Whereas the MNRA vaccines were given to the elderly population. So there is a, a positive of data regarding that. I definitely agree on it. And see, yeah. The plasma exchange is also coming up in few centers and they're found to be very useful. Now, obviously, if you look from a scientific point of view, they should be. Right. Thank you. Moving on to the next question. Um, this question I pose to both the speakers. So we have a question from Dr. Deepti. She says, 
in happy hypoxia, if a patient is very comfortable of oxygen, no tachypnea, can we allow them, despite a saturation of 85 to 90 percent, I hope I'm clear, is it a signal from the body that I'm okay? There needn't be an intervention and only steroids and medical management can be started. Or do we have to start mandatory oxygen? Dr. Deepthi, if you're here, am I posing the right question? That despite saturation of 80 to 85 to 90 and the patient is absolutely normal, not tachypneic, like in happy hypoxia, should we start mandatory oxygen therapy? I would like to pose this question to both the speakers, whosoever can answer this. Yeah. Yes, uh, Dr. Deepthi, ma'am, thanks. Nice question. But as the uh, uh, evidence suggests and the guidelines suggests, even uh, as I read the guidelines initially, uh, even uh, that AIMS uh, Delhi guideline also, even if patient has got happy hypoxia, the organ damage will be there. Yes. Okay. So we should always try to maintain at least 90 plus. That is I told clearly in the ward, it should be uh, from 90 to 92, it should be. And uh, in ICU, we can probably manage with 90, but in the ward 90 to 94 and ICU 90 to 92, because we have scope of intervention in case of problem. We don't intend to increase the SPO2 uh, to more than 94%, it is a waste. So as I told the uh, oxygen dissociation curve, once we touch the flat line, there is no need. But Definitely, patients' happy hypoxia is not at all happy for the treating physician or neither the outcome. Because I have seen happy hypoxia patient coming to my OPD uh, 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 with 74, 78, and he was talking very nicely, a farmer and a male, 60, 60 years, 65 years, very young, uh, I mean, very uh, athletic body. But when I shifted him to ward for admission after convincing that he requires oxygenation with great difficulty, he got admitted. But in the same evening, he died, unfortunately, despite of he was on BiPAP support, but uh, his oxygen saturation, lung was extensively damaged, even with this thing, we could not increase. So happy hypoxia and uh, till uh, he uh, arrested and uh, he was absolutely happy. He did not have any complaint. And I have seen even patients, young lady with uh, saturation of 78 on BiPAP, in between she was removing and talking to her kids whom she left at home on mobile phone. When I tried to uh, restrict and I tried to advise that this would be very dangerous, she did not listen. And in between, she used to remove because we had many patients, 74 patients at a stretch. I directed uh, the staffs to uh, help her so that she should not remove the mask. And despite of that, a risk factor was she was obese, young, obese, and she had two small children. And uh, most of the time, she used to try to talk to her children on video call. And then uh, one evening, she died. So that is another unfortunate incident. So this is uh, the lesson learned that happy hypoxia is not at all happy. It may be only the number is this thing, but uh, if patient uh, is uh, tolerating happy hypoxia, but still they should be aggressively treated if oxygen is required to maintain the oxygenation status. And steroids, of course, and uh, other medications, like if they are fitting into remdesivir or fitting into any uh, uh, pulse methyl prednisolone, anticoagulants, everything should be given. One thing we, uh, 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 I learned hard way that COVID should be treated very aggressively with maximum, even I am also a COVID survivor, I also had COVID. The key of the success is you should uh, hit it very hard and very fast. If you delay, then uh, problem starts. So that is why we should not delay. Yeah, I, I, I take the uh, evidence which is given by Dr. Shambhu. In fact, hypoxia, if you look at patients, as he rightly said, they look very well, but just within a few minutes, uh, they usually desaturate, they become tachypneic and die. Now, if you look at the, uh, the scientific basis, uh, as he rightly said, the oxygen dissociation curve is very, very important. If you maintain it above 90, then that's the time when the tissue perfusion would be very good. Secondly, if the hypoxia occurs, then they occur a lot of phosphorylation changes and metabolic changes, and a lot of enzymes get deranged and denatured, and so they go into severe acidosis also. So that's the reason why these people die suddenly. In fact, as you rightly said, people go to the bathroom and die, and the classic picture where people walk on the roads and just drop off like that. It's all happy hypoxia. So it's evident that in these patients, 
you should give them oxygen and maintain them at around 92, which is the ideal one, or 94 in the ward, as Dr. Shambhu said. And mind you, these patients should be given the aggressive treatment of COVID. There's no doubt about it. Oxygen, drugs, everything should be given as quickly as possible and as high doses as possible. I hope that was a crystal clear explanation to your query, Dr. Deepti. We have Dr. Prem Kumar. Sir, please yeah, go ahead. Let, let me add on this. See, hypoxia not only stops the machine, but it wrecks the machine. Yes. Suppose if your bike runs out of petrol, it will stop there. But nothing will happen to the bike. But in human beings, hypoxia, it not only stops the machine, but it wrecks the machine. And another thing, what is this all are talking about happy hypoxia? When the lung is of good compliance, even though there is hypoxia, the work of breathing is not good. I mean, uh, not that great. So the patient is very happily breathing, even though there is hypoxemia. Why they are happily breathing? Their work of breathing is less. Why their work of breathing is less? The lung is very compliant. As I said, when there are a lot of GGOs, so the uh, compliance will be good. What, what, is, what do you mean by compliance? Normal lung is like a balloon and a ARDS consolidated lung is very stiff. So normal lung, it is easy to inflate. That means good compliance. ARDS stiff lung, very difficult to inflate. That is the compliance is low. So what will happen is if you understand the Gatineonis types, L type and H type, initially to begin with a COVID pneumonia may be a good compliance lung. So even though there is hypoxia, patient is not exercising, means uh, his work of breathing is not so great. So he's comfortable. That's why he's happy, though there's hypoxia. As the time progresses on, the disease progresses to the H type. That means the compliance will be very low. So stiff lung. So where he has to do more, of, more work of breathing, then he deteriorates. So nothing like happy hypoxemia. It, at a particular point, it may be happy hypoxemia, but as the disease progresses and as the lung consolidates, as the ARDS progresses and as the complaints goes down, the happy hypoxemia will obviously will become an unhappy hypoxemia. And, uh, you know, uh, earlier talks we presented below 92%, the LOCO2 trial, that means liberal versus conservative oxygen therapy trial, where below 92%, a lot of deaths happened because of mesenteric ischemia. And above 96%, there were trials like IOTA, that is improved oxygen therapy in acute illness. IOTA is a you know, meta-analysis where 9,900 target was there. Even then there was unfavorable outcomes. So the goal is between 90 to 94. Of course, ARDS network trial, its target was 88 also. Okay, even 88 also is good. But you know, there are physiological goals in all conditions. So mild, moderate, severe ARDS, you know, 70, 60, 55 millimeters of mercury goals are also okay. But ideally, if it is between 92 to 94, that would be good. And even at 90, acceptable. But below 90, as Navin said, it will be on the downward slope of the oxygen dissociation curve. And even for a little PAO to fall, the saturation will be drastically going down. And finally, the saturation is the determinant for oxygen content and oxygen delivery, BOV2 and all those things. So just target between 90 to 94 based on the IOTA trial or the LOCO2 trial, or if it's not possible, at least target 90. Okay. In your own inimitable style, you have given a wonderful explanation, sir, uh, regarding high, happy hypoxia. I'm sure all the audience here is clear about it. Uh, moving on to the next question in the chat box, we have Dr. Rajashekar again posing a question. Um, Dr. Uh, Naveen, uh, the question is for you. Is early heparin nebulization helpful in COVID patients? I believe both the speakers can answer this question for us. Well, uh, during the first wave, I had extensively used heparin nebulization for most of my patients. Uh, and of course, uh, I do not have data to show that it has worked, uh, but it's my personal experience uh, that as uh, people have been advocating budesonide, uh, uh, heparin nebulization definitely has a role in minimizing the microvascular thrombi and the fibrosis which can occur with patients with uh, COVID-19, severe COVID-19. And I found that most of my patients did very well. 
And in fact, one of the problems with the heparin nebulization was whether there would be an increased risk of hemoptysis uh, and uh, uh, what do you call uh, the change in the voice and the respiratory cough and all these were factors which would need to be looked into. But my experience uh, in my first wave, I've used it extensively and it was very good and we never had any hemoptysis. Unfortunately, in the second wave, I couldn't use it to the same extent due to logistic reasons, but still we are using it. Uh, but I do not have data to support myself because you need uh, compared to studies to state that is, it is good. But uh, the whatever articles and whatever uh, documents are available online, they definitely say heparin nebulization helps. Uh, and I'm sure people should use it more and maybe do a compared to study and come out with uh, uh, study uh, with data. I believe, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor Naveen. Uh, I believe, Doctor Sudhakar, uh, sir, has raised his hand, sir. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, we are over shorting the time. Uh, maybe uh, you can wind up the session. Uh, they can have more questions coming up in the next uh, uh, next week because this keeps on going. Uh, this particular activity. So you may ask people to ask questions during the next time. Uh, we are over shorting our time. Uh, please wind up, uh, Doctor Tripti. So uh, I believe we have crossed our 90 minutes uh, time frame today. Um, so uh, better to wind up the session as uh, Sir has said. Uh, last question, I believe this is a situation ship and this is for Dr. Naveen to answer before we wind up the session. It is uh, uh, what has happened in uh, the whole village in UP is there yeah. was uh, the first, there was different vaccinations that happened. Yeah. First by Covaxin and the second by Covishield. So what is your take on this? Well, as the data clearly shows, the data is clearly coming up and even the CDC also is recommending it in due course of time that uh, you have to follow only one vaccination schedule. But however, inadvertently, if you have taken a second vaccine, you should follow up with the second vaccine, finish up the schedule of the second one. For example, if he's taken a, a Covishield first and a Covaxin second, then he needs to go with a booster dose of Covaxin after four weeks. Similarly, if he's taken a Covaxin earlier and he's taken a Covishield now, then he needs to take the second dose of Covishield after 84 weeks. So that's the data which is coming in and uh, that's being followed everywhere. But of course, the switching over is not correct. And as right, and I've pointed out also, even with the uh, adenovirus, vector, if because of the VITT, you don't need to postpone your second shot or go to a different vaccination. Thank you so much, Dr. Kumar. I uh, now would like our principal, sir, Dr. P. V. Sudhakar, uh, to give the closing remarks on today's session. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tripti, for so ably handling the situation. And uh, it is overwhelming in the sense that people, more and more people are uh, uh, trying to ask questions and clarify their doubts. I thank both the speakers very profusely for the uh, very scholarly presentation, as well as Dr. Prem Kumar for uh, pitching in and clarifying some of the doubts and uh, and uh, clearing the air on some of the very important issues. And uh, thank you one and all for a very nicely and lively discussion today. And um, we will come back next week uh, at the same time. Until then, goodbye, all of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, doctor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Deep Tripti. That was very interesting. And Dr. Shambhu, as usual, thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Thank Dr. Tripti, ma'am. And thank Navin, sir. So we'll catch up again. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you.